тьме, в тьме голубой ёкой, да в тайге, тайге широй ёкой, старая дерево стоит. Make sense, make sense. You know I'm back, I'm back. You know it. You know I'm back, I'm back. Come on, I'm at a break, but I keep on going. Hi guys, welcome. I'm finally doing it. I'm finally making a new presentation. <laughs> so I've tried to film, um, a bit of my thoughts around um, what is God, how does it play into this reality and just I wanted to kind of summarize and react to other people's material and their perspective and kind of give an overview. Maybe I'm going to do that in the future, however on that day it just it just wasn't it. You know how you have like your sin your inner monologue when you like go for a walk or something or just sit there and you know, uh, think about life, and I just couldn't put it into a precise conversation. Maybe I have to take even more notes. But anyway, I pulled some cards that day, and they said, you know, my higher self was like, you know, just relax, or my future self. And lo and behold, the next day, I stumbled upon gold. I stumbled upon a, um, a you can call it a manuscript, um, it is a text, a very, I don't actually know why it is that controversial, um, but we're going to go into that whole rabbit hole. It's really fascinating and interesting. I'm going to give you my opinion on the text, on the story that it's in, te in the text, um, how they tried to, uh, well, I think they were successful to override, you know, similar like they did it with Tesla. So now when you look up that book, that text, um, the only things you get is something very different from the historical uh, text uh, or even the, the sacred text that we get. Um, it's, it's really interesting. So let me just give you a quick overview of how I stumbled upon this and how I, you know, how what kind of parts are going to be uh presented to you today in this little in this little presentation so first of all i stumbled upon a deity that is called chislobok chislo is the russian word for date so until this day um when you ask what date is it it's it's chislo and so this deity is attributed to time um, to ages, uh, you can call him, it's basically the Russian version of Saturn and or Janus, but a bit different, a bit different. From what I've seen from, um, I mean, Janus is the Romanized god of, of portals, doors, um, the future and the past, and all of these elements are in that deity Chislobok, but it's even more sophisticated. So I stumbled upon him, upon him, and there's quite a lot of information on this deity in the Russian-speaking realm. In the English-speaking realm, not so much. Uh, he is discarded a pseudo-deity, and um, basically he, there isn't any information that I could find in English on the internet. Of course, I have not spent weeks looking, but um, a couple of days for sure, and um, the only thing I could find was a really small uh, Reddit thread, and um, people don't really know anything about him. It is said that he is like a lunar deity or something, and because he is officially attributed uh, or officially marked as a pseudo deity, um, yeah, there isn't much information. However, however, as I said. In the Russian-speaking realm, um, he is quite known, and there's a lot of information on this 
this archetype, so to speak. And yeah, I'm going to go into that because it's super fascinating. It's like I said, it's even more sophisticated than what I have seen uh, about Janus and his descriptions. And of course, it is an archetype, so uh, it can be used for, you know, evil and for good. Um, and so the, the deity Chislobok is uh, marked a pseudo deity because he wasn't worshipped in the pagan um, before in the pagan traditions of the Russians before they were uh, Christianized uh, around the 13th century they say but again that actually contradicts uh, Russian documents of um, I think the document was from about 200 years ago and it talked about uh, how they still had to drive the Russians into the churches to go um, to the mass, to go to the to the ritual. Um, so Russians were not Christianized, I don't know, you know, 700 years ago. So it happened just very recently um, when all of them were submi submitted <clears throat> to that. So we have very contradictory uh, statements, you know, from uh, the English speaking or the Western world, according to that, and then actual Russian documents and knowledge. So that's, it's, that's really interesting. And it is said that, that this deity was mentioned in this text. And um, I haven't read the text in Russian. It's still pretty difficult for me to read. It's easier to listen to. But... Um, I, however, put it in a translator, and of course the grammar is not very good, but you get a good overview of what is in the text, so I'm going to go into that. Um, I didn't find the mention of Chislobok, interestingly. Maybe I have overlooked it, but um, yeah. So we're going to go into this deity of uh, the Russian um, father of time, so to speak, and the whole... Uh, science behind that. Then we go, uh, we're going to go into the text and what I think about the text and what is mentioned in there. Um, then about the controversy of how this text was found, because that's also very suspicious and doesn't make a lot of sense. It was found in the early 1900s, so we know that time uh, was very interesting and um, yeah, very mysterious. We're going to go into the people that were involved in translating it and publicizing it because lo and behold, round two, um, the, the text was published in, in the Phoenix magazine. Jar Ptitsa, the firebird, the, the Russian phoenix, um, in, in the States, I think. So that's also really interesting. Um, and then, uh, what else? What else I wanted to talk about? Oh yeah, how it is overwritten. It was last year in 2021 that they overwrote this this manuscript, so you don't, you can't actually find it. Um, it's a bit easier on on Google if you put in like sacred text or something, but um, on YouTube there's you will only find one guy, a journalist, and. There is AI involved and yeah, very, very strange. I, I, yeah, it's a whole rabbit hole. It's really fascinating and I'm super excited to uh, share with you today what I found. Um, I hope you enjoy. And um, yeah, also I'm working on new artworks that that are going to be finished in the next couple of months. So if you would like to get notified about some new art pieces that I will have in my in my shop in spring, you can just go ahead to my website, thestarseedjournal.org and subscribe to the newsletter. Bleh, to the newsletter. I'm not going to send a whole bunch out so you won't get spammed, I promise. Um, it's just so you get notified if I have um, any discounts uh, any sales or if I have new work on my shop. Alrighty guys, have fun and um, let's kick it.
The Book of Velas, Ancient Slavic Text Slavic mythology refers to the Slavic polytheistic religion which was practiced by the Slavs before the period of Christianization. This religion has many common traits with other religions that derive from the Proto-Indo-European religion. The Slavic mythology is not inscribed in any verified first-hand source like the Greek or Roman mythology. In fact, historians and ethnographers find it very hard to actually prove that there was a Slavic writing system prior to Christianization. It is believed that the religious traditions, customs and beliefs of the Slavic people were orally passed down from one generation to the other and many of the wiped off and many of the wiped off by the test of time upon the rise of Christianity. Well, I think we know that there were resets and also if you have um, a calendar that does not break in time, that goes on and on for thousands of years, um, you don't need books in that sense. Also, if you can, you know, tap into the field. Before the Christianization, there are only a few historical records of Slavic religion that were mainly noted by Christian missionaries who were not Slavic and who captured only a few images of the Slavic paganism at the time. Though cults and statues have been found as archaeological remains in temples and shrines, there is no firm evidence about their context. So most of the mythological pagan beliefs that have survived till today are expressed in folk songs, stories and customs in contemporary Slavic countries. Despite the fact that there are no acclaimed sources of written accounts of Slavic mythology, which would explain the division into Western, Eastern and Southern Slavs from the Proto-Slavic tribe, there are a few controversial written sources regarding this matter, and one of them is the famous Book of Veles. Famous? Heck no! I have never, ever heard of it and it is very difficult to find as i said especially in the english speaking realm there's not a lot of information on it and yeah it's i think it's interesting that it is um it is controversial and famous um i did not know that there is like no official historic accounts of the migration of the russian people of the slavic people but now I understand why is this text is so controversial. Um, yeah, okay. The Book of Veles in Slavic History. The Book of Veles has been disputed on a great number of occasions, especially by the Russian Orthodox Church. That's where my, where my bells went ding, 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 ding. I have to look into that. Pseudo? Yes, let's look into that. And most of the scholars who deal with Slavic mythology have concluded it, it as a forgery. Of course, the main narrative and the main purpose, in my personal opinion, is to um, depict civilizations prior to us and the people prior to us as more primitive, so to speak. Um, and also, if you would account for the advancement of the deities, like... Like I said, with the Chislobok, there are mathematics in it, astrology, astronomy, all of the ancient sciences that basically let the people know in what kind of time quality and density they are in and going in or coming from so that we know what's actually going on. And yeah, anyhow, so it is concluded a forgery. Why? Let's see. The Book of Veles claims to be an authentic written record of the ancient Slavic religion that dates from the 9th to 10th century CE. I don't get why it is, why they say it is a record of the ancient Slavic religion. I read it. To me, it isn't. Uh, you get way more out of the religious things out of the um, Slavic Vedas. 
I mean, the gods are mentioned here, but it is way more a historical account of where the Slavic people started and where they went over millennia, about their leaders, about um, how they were um, split off, how that happened. It is, like I said, it is very similar to the accounts in the Oera Lind book. Um, it is less detailed, I would say. Um, and yeah, still, still they're mentioning the gods there and praise and stuff like that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's more of a historical account. And I think that's why they have the problem with, I don't, to me, it doesn't seem like a, uh, that is, a, that it is a record of the ancient Slavic religion. Anyhow, um, so, uh, it is written in Cyrillic alphabet, though it cannot be proven that the Slavs had any writing systems before Christianization. Again, there are Rus Russian alternative history researchers that have shown in all the documents that this is a scheme, that this is actually a falsification and that there were writing systems and there was one language. Even today, there is this like universal um, Slavic mix up of languages that every Slavic, that, that most of the Slavs are understand, are going to understand. And it's a mix of um, Polish, I think a bit of Ukrainian and Russian, but Russian is always the base. Russian is always the base. And the oldest Russian words are the same in, in, um, in the Sanskrit, you know, anyhow. So, um, the Slavs used the Cyrillic alphabet, which was named after the missionary, blah, blah, blah. It, this is bullshit. I'm calling bullshit on that. So let's get a bit into the story. Okay, so most of the Slavic new pagans consider the Book of Velas as a sacred text and insist on the fact that it is authentic. Reportedly, this ancient book was written on, I'm sorry, on birch barks and then was lost. Therefore, it is impossible to establish its um, authenticity in the present. We're going to go into the story more uh, detailed on who was involved, who founded, where did it go, and things like that. And also, I have a publication that went out uh, in, in Russian, um, and they also make some comments about the changes in the text and that, you know, there is probably a lot of t a lot of it has been taken out in the in the uh, things in the in the writing that we have now. According to the supporters of the Book of Velas, this supposedly medieval written text lays out historical, religious, and cultural facts about Slavic people and their lives from the seventh seventh century BC until the, until the ninth century AD. The Book of Velas was discovered in the early 20th century in a shabby Ukrainian castle by Isenbek Arthurovich. And that castle is actually in the area uh, that is now, you know, involved in a conflict. Uh, he left his homeland, Russia, and traveled for many years before he finally moved to Brussels and brought the Book of Velas with him. He presented it to the Russian scientist Yuri Mirolubov, uh, who examined the wooden planks and spent the following 15 years in translation and decoding of the carved text. Miro Lubov then concluded that the Book of Velas, written on the wooden planks, contained the oldest form of Slavic alphabet, which shared many similarities with the Cyrillic alphabet, which I also think would be way more um, closer to the truth and also you would have written this text so that every tribe, every um, uh, every tribe that has its own dialect could understand it. So naturally, it is not a clear, uh, clear uh, formulation of one language. I think if we consider that there were resets, that things you know, needed to be, um, needed to be preserved, it would be natural that it would written, it would be written in such a matter or manner that every Slav could understand it. This book can also be found under the name of Veles book, Vlesbluk, Vlesknyga, Isenbeck's planks, 
в лесбук or вилесова книга. The contents. The book of Velos was made of 42 planks made of birch wood of 15 inches by 8.7 inches. It contained text written in letters that had different shape and size. Therefore, it was assumed that different parts of the text were written on the planks at different times. And this is what the linguists actually um, do not consider. Uh, they say it's it's too much mix of different uh, words from different time periods. Therefore, it, it is a forgery and therefore they um, they made it seem older than it is, which I call bullshit on that. It was said that, although I considered it, I, I always considered the opposite side, but no, that makes no sense to me. Some planks contain symbols that appear like bullheads, as well as shapes that represent the sun and some types of animals that probably represented the months of the year. It was said that the planks were scrubbed before the letters had been carved, and then they were painted with a darker layer of paint that slowly faded as time went by. The beginning of the book has been translated as This book of Veles we, de we dedicate to our praised God, who is our strength and our shelter. And also the Western interpretation of the God of Veles is also very obscure, so I'm going to go in a short segment over the actual God Veles. Um, because again, if you go into the Russian speaking realm, it's a different thing. It's a different story and it has way more depth to it. In Slavic mythology, Veles was the god of ar ar agriculture, fertility, and cattle who supported and helped the people in need and took care of their well-being and prosperity during the entire year. So yeah, we're going to go a bit more in depth on Veles. Okay, okay, okay. Is there anything else? Slavic gods and goddesses in the book of Veles. Um, a great number of gods and goddesses that are a reference of the Slavic mythology, such as Triglav, Svarok, Perun, Svetovit, are mentioned in the so-called 11th wooden plank of the book of Veles, presented as holy companions to the tribe members. And again, I couldn't find Chislobok in it. I couldn't find the Russian genus in it. Finally, if one relies on the conclusions brought by professional historians and linguists who have specialized in ancient Slavic, the scientific examinations question many of the features in the Book of Veles, including the vocabulary, spanning, spelling, and phonetics. Scientists claim that the, book, that the text in the Book of Veles was created by someone who insisted on including elements of so-called ancient Slavic language, but with an evident lack of knowledge of the grammar system. Regarding this matter, the philologist O.V. Tvorogov has reported that the linguistic analysis has led scientists to conclude that they were dealing with an artificial language that was invented by someone who could not create his own language system and was insufficiently acquainted with the structure and his history of Slavic languages. Most of the academic circles consider the Book of Velix a hoax as the Slavic Vedas as the Oerlen book. Uh, that is controversial enough to take part in any school or educational program. Although attempts of this kind were made back in 1999 in Ukraine when the book was included in the high school program of history education and it stayed there for about 10 years. History of the book's discovery according to Mira Lyubov. In 1919, a lieutenant of the White Russian Army, Fedor Arturovich Isenbeck, found a bunch of wooden planks and a strange script in a looted mansion of Kurakins near Kharkiv, Ukraine. The Kurakins, uh, or the House of Kurakin, is a name of an old historical Russian princely family descended from Lithuanian dynasty of Gediminas, and it's also a masculine surname. Um, and Kharkiv is at the moment in the hotspots of the conflict. After the defeat of the army, Isenbeck emigrated to Belgrade, 
where in 1923 he unsuccessfully tried to sell the planks to the Belgrade Library and Museum. In 1925 he settled in Brussels, where he gave the planks to Yuri Mirolubov, who was the first to study them seriously. Isenbeck treated the planks very carefully, did not allow them to be taken out of his house and refused a suggestion by a professor of University of Brussels to hand them over for studying. Well, <laughs> in my opinion, of course, of course, from all of the research we have done and what we have seen, artifacts such as these, um, especially because this artifact um, gives a historic account for which there is no other um, mention because the Russians um, before Christianization supposedly had no no writing, no nothing. Um, so yeah, I can understand why uh, he would not give it over to any sort of institution. Later, this refusal to permit others to study these texts would lead people to suspect them as forgeries. And just to say, I mean, he tried to sell it, so um, yeah. Interesting. For 15 years, Miro Lyubov restored, photographed, transcribed, um, as photographs proved to be unreadable. Interesting. Why were there they unreadable? And he finally translated the text. He managed to transcribe most of the planks. In August 1941, Nazi Germany occupied Brussels, Isenbeck died and the planks were lost. Miro Lyubov emigrated to the to the United States and passed the materials in 1953 to Professor A. A. Kurenkov, who then published them in the magazine Jar Ptica, Firebird, from March 1957 until May of 1959. Later, the text was studied by Sergei Paramonov. So, um, if we look at the biography of this guy, um, he's called, his last name is Miro Lyubov, uh, which translates to um, the one who loves the world. Mir is the world and Lyubov means love. So here's a, a short uh, passage that I found about his life. In the civil war, he was in the ranks of the armed forces of the Central Council in Kiev and then went to, to the Don where he served in the troops of General Denikin. In 1920, he was evacuated to Egypt, where he managed to get on an expedition bound for Central Africa. Along the way, he falls ill and ends up in a hospital in South Africa, from where, um, after discovering, from here, after discovering, he left for India. So he started in Ukraine, then went over to Egypt, then Central Africa, and then he left for India, um, where he stayed for a very short time and was forced to seek refugee in Turkey. Um, with the assistance of the Russian consul in Istanbul, um, then he was in late 1922, he obtained permission to move to Prague. He studied at Prague and um, then he was forced to leave Prague because of political reasons, and he ended up in the United States, where he then published his works. So he also wrote a lot of books and papers, short stories, poems, articles, um, and around 5,000 pages of his uh, literary heritage were published then by his widow. Um, and yeah, he he people say that you know he actually wrote this book and honestly i could get behind that idea and also i mean he traveled a lot and he was very interested in the folklore he um one of his books or um writings were for example rigveda and paganism russian pagan folklore um, the Slavs and the Carpathians, criticism of Normanism. Um, so he, he went a lot into the prehistoric uh, uh, history of, of, the, of the Russians or the Slavs or whatever. So I could imagine that he was actually looking for maybe evidence along his, his trips, along his, his journey. Um, 
I don't know if that was on purpose that he went to all of these places or not, but it wouldn't surprise me if, if he picked up different things and stories in these different countries because these countries or nations are mentioned later on in the Book of the Less. And also the title, um, we're going to speak at, about the title in a second. It's It uh, has to do with the last person that studied this. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he actually picked up all of these stories from from texts and accounts in all of these countries and then later on put them down into these planks. That would be definitely a a possibility. And um, yeah, that would not negate the content of the book. Sergei Paramanov. The last one involved in this whole mystery of the Book of Veles is um, Sergei Paramonov. Um, I will, of course, link all of the all of my sources down below if you want to have a more closer look at him. Um, basically, he was he was an academic. He he um, was a zoologist, and he did many different things. He also traveled c quite a lot in his in his life. But um, on the on the topic of the book. In 1954, Sege Paramonov received the White Emigre magazine, Jar Ptica, Firebird, which was published in San Francisco from Alexander Kurenkov. The magazine contained a letter from there, um, Brussels reader Yuri Mirolubov, where he reported about strange artifacts, carved planks, which had been found by Fedor Isenbeck near Kharkiv when he had uh, been serving as a colonel of the volunteer army. I know I said Lieutenant Colonel, uh, there are different descriptions of him. According to Mirolubov, after the white movement defeat, Isenbeck took the planks um, in emigration and they were lost in Belgium during the Second World War. Um, so Paramonov was very impressed that uh, that information about that information and took from Kurenkov and Mirolubov all ava available materials about Isenbeck's planks. Um, so he obtained a photograph of plank 16, uh, which was the only plank uh, supposedly where uh, you could actually see what has been photographed. So which is strange because it's, it's in the 50s, you know, uh, photography has been around quite a long time. And um, yeah, so they say initially Sergei Paramonov believed in the Book of Veles' authenticity and reckoned that it had been written in the Proto-Slavic language. He started studying and analyzing the text and wrote articles about it. Now, I could not find those articles. Yeah, he, he wrote articles about it for Ukrainian and Russian emigrant magazines. Um, in fact, Paramonov made the information about the Book of Veles to be available for the general public. Eventually, it resulted that the Book of Veles has become like the Bible for many Slavic neo-paganism movements, I think probably all together with, uh, with the Slavic Vedas. Um, Paramonov needed to prove the Book of Veles' authenticity, so he sent all his researches and all materials he had to the Academy of Sciences of the USSR under the mediation of the University of Melbourne. Interesting. That smells fishy, doesn't it? And of course, the Soviet scientist's verdict was the Book of Veles is a literary forgery. Kaboom, boom. So now we are getting into a bit of a strange territory here. Um, I want to talk about a person that uh, a journalist that published a book last year in 2021 with the same title it is called the book of Veles. Uh, from what i know is that he basically wanted to investigate a disinformation or misinformation uh, industry or machinery that is or was located in the in the village of Veles in Macedonia um, and it has to do with a lot of the misinformation that is supposedly that was taken place um, at the elections in 2016, 17 with Trump. So he's he's not in favor of that guy. Uh, I'm neutral. I don't 
really care about him. Um, but anyhow, he wanted to investigate that. He went there and unfortunately everything had already been closed down. Um, it was supposedly run by teenagers who would like put up a fake news sites with like fake headlines and these would be featured. So um, yeah, I because this person is still alive um, and just of general uh, decency, um, I will not I will do my best to try to not put words in his mouth or attack him, but still I have to be critical of his intentions and what kind of consequences this has because the thing that he published is very, very weird. So he went there, he's also a photographer, he went there to, to the village of Veles. He took photographs around because he couldn't find anyone to interview because it was all shut down and of course if you are in such a you know operation you will most likely not give any interviews especially when you're a teenager anyhow he couldn't really find anything to photograph or anyone to interview so what he did was he took photographs there and later on when he came back home he started to manipulate these photographs to put um to generate basically um, animated models and put them, melt them, so to speak, together with the photographs. And then he put a whole lot of information about misinformation into sort of a AI program and it sped out interviews. So this whole book is fake. Um, it was sort of a coup, a sort of, oh, let me give society back what society is generating. So, um, of course, that's my personal opinion. I do think that this needed to be done. I think it's very unnecessary and yeah, I'm really questioning what kind of a energy was behind that idea. So I'm just going to play you a really uh, quick uh, clip of, of an interview he did, just so you can hear him speak about how this uh, creation of this um, AI overlay or version of the Book of Wellness came to be and you can you know, make yourselves uh, a, a, an impression and build an opinion yourselves. But yeah, I am very critical about it. I don't think it's a coincidence and it's very weird. Like, why would you do that? But I'm generally, oh, I'm generally, now the German comes in, I'm generally always skeptical when it comes to AI stuff and uh, technological stuff because we are not, most of us are not in the right mindset or in the spiritual uh, evolution or uh, place in the place of wisdom where we can where we can where we can actually use that in a uh, constructive and positive way I don't think this thing needed to be published I don't think it does anything uh, I think yeah it's it's very very strange intelligence uh, gun generated portraits you know this sort of this person does not exist dot com kind of thing uh -huh. That's you know, the thing is, once I started, I mean, it, it was almost from the first moment I downloaded the software, I was looking at my screen and looking at this very lifelike character that you can make look exactly how you want, you know, big, small, uh, beautiful, ugly, whatever, you know, the moment I was looking at this face, it scared me, right? I mean, I, I could see, you know, this is not that hard to do. You know, this is really close to sort of photography. Uh, it was like looking at something that, I mean, I can come, it, it was like looking at waking up my own Frankenstein monster. You know, it's kind of like this. This is totally frightening. I'm creating this thing. I shouldn't be doing it. You know, it's like this. I should stay way the hell away from this. I should be running away, but I can't because it's so fascinating. It's dangerous. What is dangerous is also seductive, of course, and it's... So to finish off this video, um, I'm going to do a little separate video on Chislobok about the deity of cosmic time. Uh, I'm going to make a part two because it's getting a bit long here. But I wanted you to... Um, I wanted to read to you the, uh, the preface of one of the publication of the Book of Veles. As I mentioned before, there are many different accounts, sorry about that, uh, different publications 
were different things that are embedded in the book. So I just wanted you to, re uh, to read to you this specific preface because it is very, um, it, it, it feels very authentic and yeah, it, it gives a bit of context um, that has been dismissed in, lot, in all of the other sources that I have been showing to you. So let me just read that and I translated, translated it from Russian. Okay. The Book of Veles is a book containing particles of the ancient Slavic Aryan wisdom, preserved by the Novgorod Magi of the 9th century, mainly dedicated to the god of wealth and wisdom of the ancient Slavs, Veles, wealth and wisdom, as he is incorrectly called by many of the modern scientists, the cattle god. The book reflects the history of many European and Asian peoples, approximately from the 2nd millennium BC to the 9th century AD, and historians recognize it as an absolutely reliable historical document that corresponds to many modern historical ideas about those ancient and mysterious times. So that was obviously before everybody dismissed this text. Uh, let's let's move on. The story of finding it is of finding it is mysterious and tragic. The book of Veles is a complex and voluminous source of ancient knowledge. This is a message from the depths of millennia to us who call ancestors contemptuously and dismissively pagans. But the Book of Veles calls pagan tribes hostile to the Slavs who believed in other gods. In addition, an in-depth philological study of the Old Russian language unequivocally in indicates that the Slavs called pagans the Slavs called pagans those who spoke other languages, believed in other gods, betrayed or distorted the culture of their ancestors by introducing incompre incomprehensible reforms into the ancient Slavic Aryan faith. Or, as would I would suggest, changing those deities so that they become uh, their negative polarity um, or their chaotic self. Which is interesting because here Veles is described as the god of wisdom and wealth and um the guy who published the ai book calls him the god of chaos and mischief i don't know about mischief but the god of chaos and something else so a complete inversion of what he actually stands for which they often do as i say with pre-christian especially with the slavic people it's so interesting the ancient slavs were people of the vedic culture related to the culture and beliefs, one can even say the ancestors of ancient India and ancient Germany, Scandinavia, Iceland, as well as the beliefs of the ancient Persians, Avesta. It should be noted that the dates and facts of the Veles book coincide with the data of historical science, which confirms the authenticity of the book of the Novgorod priests Magi. So again, all of the uh, the criticism and why it is um, marked a forgery is our linguistic things uh, not taken in consideration all of the other, th other things that are uh, mentioned in, in, in the text, in the stories. Recently, there's evidence that the archive did not actually, actually burn down, but only moved abroad which is stored in the hands of collectors of antiquities.